Bam, and there you have it. Now you know how to scrape SEC filing form and port in Python. We covered web scraping, XML parsing. Finance family, it's your other brother Adam Git Bags, and today I'm gonna to be showing you how to scrape SEC filing form and port in Python. So we're gonna be doing some web scraping and XML parsing, very monetizable skills. Let's jump right in. Here's the script. All my scripts are on my GitHub. I'll put the link in the description so you can follow along. First thing, let's import our modules. We got requests, pandas, and beautiful soup. And then we've got a dictionary here. This is just where we're gonna store our data that we scrape off of this form. So here's form import. Let's copy this link out and open it in Google. Now here's the form import. As you can see, a very exciting form. So this video is probably gonna be pretty entertaining. Now form import is filed by registered investment companies to the SEC to disclose portfolio holdings and other information like that. So somebody came to me and they said, hey, I wanna scrape this information for these interval funds. Can you help me? And so that's why I'm making this video. So here in our imports, we have beautiful soup. So we can go to the beautiful soup for documentation to pop that open and then here, all of the methods I'm going to use, you can find them in this sidebar, this nav bar here, and just put control F and then search for the function name here. Next, I've got this function and it's going to request a page. So we're going to input a URL here and then our custom headers. I'll show you how to get those later. And then we're going to just use a get request to our URL. We're going to pass the custom headers and then it's going to check the status code and then return back our response. And then if not, then we're in trouble. Up next, we've got our custom headers here. I'll show you how to get these. So if we come over to our form, we can right click inspect and that's going to open up our dev tools. So if you click under network and then you press control R, that's going to bring up some different items here. And then here we can see the endpoint essentially or the page URL, excuse me. If you go to copy and then copy as curl, then you could come over to your script and you could paste that into like a text editor so you can see the different headers right here. So you need to clean it up a bit and then put it into a dictionary. So you'll notice here, I don't have all the headers. This is the minimum headers that I needed to get a 200 response. So it's probably best to use all of the headers, but this is the minimum headers I needed at this time to get a 200 back. So I went through one by one and just deleted the ones that I didn't need to get a 200. So that's probably the easiest way to get the headers. If you want, you can click this doc and you can look at more information. If you scroll down, you'll see the request headers there. So basically not knowing about the other way, I just copied these out, pasted them into the script, and then I cleaned them up into a dictionary. Dictionary, JSON, call it whatever you want. So here we have our request page. So I've defined the URL here, which I forgot, and now I'm ready to send this request on through. We can look at that response and we see a 200. All right, so now we're gonna start working with our response a bit. So here's res.content, and as you can see, it's a bunch of content. Okay, so this next line of code, we're gonna begin parsing the content. So I went ahead and ran that, and as you can see, it's some HTML and then a bunch of nested tables. So these methods that you're about to see from Beautiful Soup 4, if you're using an HTML parser, they'll still work. So now that we've got our beautiful soup object, we can start parsing through it. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to find all of the tables inside of our soup. So if we look here, we have a bunch of tables. It's a list, as you can tell. And if you want to get an idea for how many tables there are, there's 198. And as you could see from our soup, there's a bunch of nested tables. So there's probably some redundancy if you're just parsing through every single table. Keep that in mind. So now that we have all the tables, let's look at the first table. You can see it returns the information from the top of the page right here. And then you can see it also has our first data piece that we want to scrape out, which is our filer CIK. As you can see here, our table has an ID of header, so you can also find all by ID. So we want to find all the tables by ID. This is going to return back to us our table, and as you can see, it keeps growing. It's a pretty large table. So along the same vein, we can also find all tables with the class filer information. So if we scroll down a bit here, we can see that we have another table with class filer information, and then there is our first label and our first data point. So if I run the code here, I can print out the table. And you can see here's our table and then here's our first label and our first data point. So now that we know how to find a table by class, we can go into our first table with the class filer information and we can find all the table rows. 
Now if we print out the first thousand characters of the first row in that table, we can see here is our table row. We're gonna to wanna to go a little bit further and grab these table data tags. So boom, let's go a little bit further and let's find all the table data that's within this row. So here's what we get. As you can see, here's the first table data and then here's the second table data. We're gonna to wanna to go in there and grab out this text value. So if we use the code from the sample data right here, so we wanna to go to the first item in that list, we wanna use dot text and then strip equals true. That's gonna return back our label. Then we gotta go a little bit further for the second item here. We gotta go into the div and then we're gonna grab out dot contents. So we're going into the div and then we're grabbing out the contents here. So as you can see, that works nicely. So this variable sample XML data is essentially what we want, but if for the whole entire report. So we want the label here and then we want the data. So if we see here on our document, we have our label and then we have our data. You can also, of course, inspect this inside of the HTML. So it's all very similar as you'll see in the dev tools to what you've been seeing here. So this block of code here is just using the HTML parser instead of the XML parser. And you can see that the methods work the same, but this is an XML document. So we're just gonna stick to XML. And then this block of code here, this just detects rows from our XML rows that have nested tables. So you can see here that the first three tables do not have nested tables, but then after that, many nested tables. So you can run this down the rest of the rows to get an idea of how much duplication you're doing. Okay, bear with me on this, but it's important to know about your nested tables just in case an unnested version of that table exists further in the tree. So if we loop through the row in all the XML rows and there's nested tables inside of those rows, but the tables exist somewhere else, then you're just duplicating your efforts. If that doesn't make sense, I wouldn't worry about it too much, but some things to think about when you're designing. So we're gonna throw caution to the wind and we're gonna loop through the XML rows and parse out everything we can. The first thing we're doing is we're finding our label. So we're using find table data with the class label. If you look at a sample here, the first thing we have is table data with the class label and then inside of it, there's our label. So we're gonna grab that out. So if we are able to get a value back here, then we're gonna to proceed to find the table data. Now we wanna find the table data here. So we're using find next sibling TD. So if we find the next sibling, which would be here, then we're gonna be grabbing this whole element. All right, this if block, we're gonna skip it for now and we're gonna go down here. This is a more simple case. So if you see, here's the label and a very basic text box, we're gonna be getting these very simple cases here. The big if block is gonna cover these two buttons here. So if we're looking at a very basic text box example, we're just gonna use get text, we're gonna grab the label, and we're gonna use get text and grab the data. And then we're gonna store it in a dictionary similar to what you saw right here where we have our label and then we have our value. So here's our label and then there's our value. And then we're just gonna store that into our dictionary. So if we take a look back at our table again, we have here our table filer information, but if we scroll a little bit further down, as you can see on the page here with our buttons, we can see here's where the buttons start. So we have our label here, and then below it we have our table data, which has our buttons inside of it. So we wanna extract live and we wanna extract text, but then we also wanna identify is the button checked or unchecked. So that's what this block does here. So if we have a table data value and then we go into there and we find a span with a class of yes or no, then we're going to proceed with the below block. We're going to grab the label out here just like we did in the below example, but then we're going to find our first image tag and then we're going to find a second image tag. So if you notice here, we have our first image tag and then before it gets closed, a second image tag gets opened up. So we're going to find the child image tag. I probably didn't say that right, but I think that they will get the idea. So to get our first label, we're gonna come over to our image and then we're gonna find next, which if you don't know what that does, you can look it up in the docs because I showed you. And then we're gonna see if there's the word unchecked inside of our image attribute SRC. So here's the SRC attribute and then we're seeing if unchecked exists there. So if so, then we're gonna leave unchecked as our data value. And then if not, then we're gonna leave checked because if it's not unchecked, then it's checked. Seems logical to me. 
And then next, we're gonna do the same exact thing, but for our second image element. So we're just gonna do that. And then we're gonna save this to a dictionary. So just as you see here, label and then data, label data. And then we're gonna store that dictionary in our dictionary under its label here. So here's the original label, and then here's the secondary labels that you see there. We're gonna save that. So that's how it works. This part just goes through all the rows in the first table and then saves everything to a dictionary. And so then I'm gonna print it out here. Let's run it and just see how fast it goes. So pretty quick, right? So if we pretty that up a little bit, then you can see here's all the data that we've parsed out. It looks pretty good. You can see it handles, you know, some buttons, but it's not perfect, right? So like our labels have new line and then a bunch of tabs. So you might want to fix that up. So here's all our data. As you can see, it runs pretty fast. And then here we're able to parse out all that information. Bam, and there you have it. Now you know how to scrape SEC filing form and port in Python. We covered web scraping, XML parsing. If you're gonna do this at scale, there's probably gonna be thousands of these documents. So you wanna use rotating proxies so you don't get IP banned. If you love the content, you can buy me a coffee in the link below. Let's get these bags.